Get in my fucking letter. I don't care because there's a reason why, and you have to sit right here. Find me, but the audio at least should. Okay. So let's see if we can still hear me. If I went and you couldn't see me. Okay, great then. Okay. Where's it on the gate here? Yep. Yeah, at the end, it's on it's on a lamp pole right at the end. It's not where they found the bar. No. But you it's, see, it's, that's why well, it's it's, 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 it's only a couple blocks from there. What were you doing last night? Between, I had actually like you know when you were here the last time. Um, I went to the general delivery and for some strange reason, welfare has denied my case. I have to reapply, so I went off time to walk with me then. Because I said I have nobody to go to the cold for. I have nothing to do. So I explained it to Allison. Allison, you know, Allison and I spent like two hours trying to get a hold of welfare. You know, they give you the pure padding bullshit. And um, tomorrow I just got to go reapply and call for it for that hearing. Is that all part of Giuliani's new program? I, I don't really understand why I was denied because I complied to everything that they asked me to up to. I brought them information all the way from doctors that my case had been closed to them. They had my medical papers in the doctors, you know, St. Joseph's Hospital. And um, I just, they, they give you this run around that they don't tell you what they want. So yeah, I was counting on this money. I mean, it was 45 days, over 45 days. I was counting on monies and now I have it. So, I don't know. But I am going to the Cope for thanks to Miss um, Miss Allison and, mm -hmm. you know, cause she's gonna make sure that I, you know, she already had me put on a space anyway, but. Saying I, I saw Allison last night. I, I know, I yeah. because when, we, when, when she met you, uh -huh. we had left each other. Yeah, she said that. So she's telling me, she, you know, she's thinking of putting me on her staff part-time, okay. you know, for a little, you know, answering the phones and doing a little paperwork. And then, off the camera, Randy, and Brandy teaches me how to make these holders on his door. I can do a couple of days work over there. Because I do like to work. I, I you know, because it helps me in my hair. What kind of work have you done? Um, the last 30 some odd years, I've been a food service man. But, I, I pick up things very easily and I can work and do what has to be done. If I'm shown once or twice, I know what to do. And you know, I'm not afraid of work, I'm not afraid of living things. And, and even through the years of uh, being a food service, part of the job, I, I was always a food service working manager, so I always worked my mother. I mean, I've run units by myself just myself and my cashier. I did the cooking, the ordering, the paperwork, and all of the other stuff, you know, so. It's not like I don't know what I'm doing. I just haven't done it in three years. I haven't been working in three years. But anything, anything that, you know, comes my way and then I can, and I'm capable, you know, once I know that I'm capable of doing it, and it doesn't take, that much for anybody to learn how to do it. If you're an intelligent person, you can do anything in life besides, you know, hustling on the streets. And I learned that a lot of years ago when I moved upstate and I was able to buy a house. So I know that I'm an intelligent person. You know, what I thought we could do today is um, from here, let's head on down to the piers. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll go I straight up want, Christopher I, Street. I just want to wash up a little bit, dude. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, How do you well, wash up? Well, we have water jugs. Well, we have kind of have We have some over here. We get them. We get water from the fire hydrant. Yeah. We fill these up and we wash up with these. 
We take our little horse bears, as I call them. During the summer months, we were actually going out in the 500 and then just taking a shower one time. How long have you lived here? I've been here since a week before Gay Pride Day this year. Did you did you build this yourself or? Actually, someone else built this. Actually, you see this house over here, Randy, is Terry's house. Uh huh. Does Terry still live there? No, she's gone. But that was Terry's house, and Terry went through two winters here. Yeah. And. How John come and Jim to live down the street on Shady yeah. Brook Lane as we call it. Yeah. yeah, I want you to uh, I want you to be there. Yeah. Um, actually John is cleaning right now. Uh -huh. uh, built this. Yeah. But then they decided to move down there and they actually built this house too. Now how sturdy is this? I mean when it actually it's very good. Let me um and when see, we have let a me wind... go see if my little friend. Okay, when we have a windstorm, does it, uh... Oh, it holds, no, it up, holds up very up. well. Right here, you can film oh, in here. John is sleeping. Okay. This is my little segment of the house. Because Minnie and Tom live on that side. You can mm -hmm. go in and film. It's, you know, very de decor, you know. We haven't filmed cute, you know. We haven't you dressed up. This is my closet where I keep my clothes, you know. Any gowns? No, the gowns, you know, I don't keep them. Mm -hmm. I can't keep that much stuff there. Mm -hmm. This is the bedroom. Mm -hmm. This is the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Now, do the, is this, the, does this belong to the city? This the property? The property belongs yeah. to the city. It does. Mm. And, um, we just like um, Do you have electricity? I see a fan. Yeah, well, but that I found in the street and I've never been able to sell since this thing. Oh. But um, <laughs> we, you know, we keep it up. And yeah. you know, I know being that you you knew Marsh for a long time as well as I did, you know, I got my little candles burning in the corner for the same stuff. Uh huh. And we're we're like doing um we what we had the summer summer house, as we called it. All this was not covered up there. Uh -huh. All this was open with plastic that we would roll up so we could uh -huh. have air. But now that it's winter, and it's getting a but little you, what, You have no heat, though, right? We have no heat. And um, we're just, like, doing this until we get out of here before the winter comes in. Uh huh. But like I said, the kids, um, Jim and John, um, like I told them that you. you Have know, you ever spent a winter in these, in you know, like out of doors in an I spent, environment like this? I spent winters with um, Marsha and some of the other drag queens many years ago before Star House and drawing, you know, drawing the beginning of Star House out mm -hmm. in the street, but. They didn't have homeless encampments in those days. We didn't. Did they? We, we slept in hallways. Or either Marsh or I had a hotel room where we snuck everybody in. You know. It wasn't like this. This uh -huh. is like a complete new atmosphere for me because I mean I've been like I stood like this. Let me have a cigarette before you go. You know, um, yeah. While we're doing this, why don't we get a little into it? Why don't we take the um, microphone out and I'll shoot you on your Stonewall Veterans meeting. Is... Okay, we happen to, over here, we happen not to be HIV positive or anything. But my friends and the kids, as I call them, because they're all younger than me, uh -huh. they are actually ill. There's two people down there that's got full blown AIDS that have been out in the streets for 10 years. And I don't see where this money is going from this community that... I'm not saying that they have to... Have, are they plugged in to try to get into places like Bailey House? They have tried. House? They have tried. They have tried. So just because they're homeless, you're just the lowest priority, right? Uh, yeah, that's the whole thing. And it's, you know, it's funny that, um, like I said, I'm going to bring it up at the meeting.
tomorrow. I, I want a meeting with the director of the Gay Community Service Center and find out why there's nothing being done. I mean, even bag lunches, what does it cost? I mean, it's a tax write-off. Well, what if you could try God's Love We Deliver? When people they, deliver around here, they deliver over there to this pier. They don't no. think about the pier. Now, what, what is this pier over here? Over there, that's what was called in the paper a couple of months ago. That's shanty town. The Hushies are shanty town. Unfortunately, yeah, on the other side, so. unfortunately yeah. it's like, you know, our, our community has always been drug orientated and whatnot. On, on this side of the pier, which, you know, a lot of people notice the red, white, and blue and the gay colors flying, and it's always cleaner than over there. So they don't come over here because they figure that we don't have a spot. Better than they do. Is it are they gay over there or is it? There nice? are some there were basically a lot of um drag queens that live down at that end, but mostly all straight up at this end. Uh -huh. Over here this is this is our little gay community here. Now you said about drugs. Is there more are they more drug oriented on the other side over there? Actually the way that the New York Times and whatnot and what the girls put into the paper, the drag queens let themselves into be interviewed and they and they tell them that they were crackheads and they would go out up the street right here. And you know, when we go out, I'll show you where they'll hustle, where they hustle at night and whatnot. And it's they put their own business out on the street, which has made that very hot. The, the police don't bother us here because they know that we don't do anything except sit around and get drunk or either. Because basically, I hate to use the word, but the majority of, of us in our little gay pier, we, we're, we, we all have a drinking problem. We have an alcoholic problem. And but we're not into the heavy drugs or anything. And I'm the first one to say, oh, I'll smoke a joint in a minute with a, with a beer in my hand, but my thing is alcohol, and Randy, you've known that for years. <laughs> but let me but take... Why don't you, why don't, we have like a mic and everything. Uh -huh. So maybe you can like give Randy a tour of the piers. Well, I was sure to do it one now. I don't, that, that one I don't go to. All right. uh -huh. That one I definitely do not touch. This one I want, this is what is mainly my main interest, you know, as far as documenting anything yeah. for my memoirs and, I, uh, you know. But because these kids, it's like, you know, you spoke to Janice the other day, you saw how disorientated she was. Yeah. yeah. And these are, these are my main concerns right now. I mean, I've always been a rebel. And I'm not even thinking of myself or getting myself off the streets at this point. I'm thinking of more of the people that are that have the HIV virus. Have they have they tried getting an like IGMHC, any of those organizations um, to help them? They have gone to several organizations and people are just not giving the help that we think they're supposed to be giving. And that's what's beginning to bother me. I see that there's so much money after Sunday, the money that was raised. Why didn't the gay men's health crisis get the money? It went to the gay, lesbian service center, not to where it's supposed to go. As far as I'm concerned, that money had no business being directed to the gay service center. You mean you're talking about the Gay Community Center? or Right, the Gay Community yeah. Center, or whatever they call it. Now, the lesbian uh -huh. gays, you know. I still call, I, to me, there's only one word. It's gay. Lesbian, lesbians and gays, as far as in my book, you know, through all the years that I've been in the movement, I never, I've always had the respect for the lesbians and whatnot, but Randy, you and I both know that when the Stonewall Rebellion started and the Stonewall Riots started, there were no gay women that were arrested. And why lesbians have to be put in front of the word gay when we're all gay. 
then we might as well just start a whole new segment in our history and have everybody define drag queens. You know, it's it, everything is lesbian and gay. And as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe that it should be that way. Well, during the Stonewall era, there was real segregation. I remember, I mean, you almost never had any contact between lesbians and gay men. Unless you I mean, went... there were a couple lesbian bars, but no one ever went there, and very few lesbians came to gay male bars. And, and that's true. We should do, like, an interview with the, the mic, because then yeah, I can well, get both of you on. Okay. I think that would be a better... Tacky? Yeah, I call her Miss Tacky, and then I got... Mm -hmm. Her sister looks like her. And I call her Shady, uh -huh. Shady Brook Lane, and then we got Bruno. And I think they were the, the other two are sleeping somewhere. Mm. You're gonna give them away? We're gonna give them to. Uh... Yeah, they're gonna donate them. To we wanted to give them to an AIDS hospital, but yeah. from what we understand is that um, something in. The feline stool. Right, toxoplasmosis. Right. right. Causes. So we're going to give them to like a, uh, an air for, for the elderly. Uh -huh. You know, because we, we want them to get good homes. And the moms we're going to keep, which is called Sylvia the Cat. <laughs> Miss Terry did name her cat after me. And, um, but, um, what happened to Terry since he got kicked out? Terry is running around getting drunk and acting stupid. I'm fortunate, you know, I've known Terry for 26 years and he's just wasted all the he's time. He's just like lost all sense of reality. And it's, you know, they say alcoholics hit bottom and then either they bounce back or they die. But, I, I don't think with Terry, unfortunately, I don't think she's hit bottom and she's not going to bounce back right now. I don't see it. It's like, you know, I hit bottom. I You know, this is not my first time that I've hit bottom as far as, you know, because of my drinking and whatnot, but... Well, you find out life's a roller coaster. You're on top and one I, day and, and on the bottom... Uh, and, 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 you're on, and then you're on the top and then you come back That's down right. and, and, you know... It's like when I lose my my head and whatnot, I, you know, do stupid things like I did in May, you know, jump in the river and try to kill myself because I, you know, that's when I reach bottom, then I bounce back. But what's giving me a lot of incentive right now is like being back in the village instead of being in Westchester and keeping myself confined from what my life has always been is to fight for something and and stop being comfortable because I was comfortable for a lot of years you know like I said we owned a house my lover and I did own a house and um, I ran a catering business on the side I was making monies but and actually what happened, you know, it's been like three years is when, Ma, when, when I got that telegram, the marshal was dead. I mean, I lost a lot of my incentive to do anything. And that's when I started reaching for the bottle more heavily than I was doing. And I find myself back in the situation, but as I look at the river a lot of times, and marshal gives me a lot of strength, is that I got to keep fighting for somebody because Marsha was a fighter, we were both fighters, and we, I am a survivor. Marsha is not here to survive with me. Marsha unfortunately had to, she passed on, but she's with me in spirit, and she gives me a lot of hope. Every time I look at that damn river and I sit there and meditate on the river, she gives me, I actually feel her spirit telling me you got to keep fighting girly because it's not time for you to cross the river Jordan, Jordan. <laughs> and we were supposed to cross it together you know that's one reason the cops thought that uh, she committed suicide because she had been heard saying to somebody in a bar 
across the River Jordan. I said, she said that five for times years. a day. For years. For five times a day, every day of her life. For years. For years. It was there her was favorite one, term. There, there was an incident one time when I lived with her on 12th Street that she came in and she was at a dance. And her and Terry had to break down the house to her door because I had slipped my wrist. I had lost it. It actually was like the fourth anniversary gay march when I was beat up on stage by Vito Russo. Mama Jean told him to go ahead and do it. That's when Gino Leary got powerful and drag queens were no longer needed in the movement. Gino Leary finally sort of had a scandalous end, you know. Yes, I understand that, the old tacky bitch. <laughs> I love her deal. But Marsha came home and it, she felt that I had done something. And I had the wall splattered with blood and whatnot. I got 60 mm. stitches because I slid up. Ugh. And she came home and her and Terry were actually the ones that had me sent to the hospital. And, and Marsha said, you're not crossing that River Jordan without me. Me and you and I will cross it together. And when she died, Part of me went with her because one of our packs was that we would always cross the River Jordan together. And to me, this is the River Jordan, the Hudson River. And what, what I did in May to jump in the river in Yonkers and when I was that I was at my I was really at my wit's end. And but then I realized that living again and being able to. How did, how did that happen to make the New York Times? Um, actually, what what was happening was that Michael Musto from the Village Voice yeah. was coming up to do the article for the Village Voice on, as he says, a falling angel, a falling icon of the movement, that I was down and out. And um, David Isaiah, who's been a very good supporter of, of me for years, was giving me money and whatnot, and he says, well, Sylvia, I can't get the community to help you, but maybe if it's put out into, into the public, you might get some financial help and whatnot. And through that, um, the article came out, and then the guy from the New York Times showed up and, at the hospital. John! John! This is, this is green lightning. This is obviously the beer that Sylvia Rivera prefers. I think the people that make green lightning have a great media opportunity here to make millions of dollars in sales by having Sylvia go on nationwide to say this is her favorite drink. Look at this, green lightning for breakfast. Sylvia Rivera's secret to a, a happy, healthy, and successful long life. <laughs> <laughs> you. Ah, I was saying, trying to I'm read trying, me. I, no, I'm not reading you. I said Green Lightning could make millions by having you endorse their beer on nationwide right. TV, right? I never heard of Green Lightning. Oh, it was a cheap beer. Oh, really? It's a dollar fifty for forty Is ounce. Is it a good beer? It's all right. All right. It's no. a terrible hangover two days late. Oh. Well, it, beer's... Takes, it takes me two days to get sober. <laughs> Well, beer is supposed to be healthier than alcohol. I like vodka. I have a weakness for vodka, which will kill you quicker than beer. I love vodka. <laughs> I sit here and I drink vodka by you the day. You mean we might have a future together yet? That's right. <laughs> well, the other day when you were saying in yeah. the store, well, I'm having, well, I'm having my cocktail when Coco walked in. Right. And she says, well, have a cocktail. I says, well, I'm having my cocktail. I want it so bad. I says, can I please have one? You could have said I would have given you but, one. You know, I was like, you know. And then, you know, I felt a little embarrassed yeah. when she, you know, as we were leaving, you know, because I had already asked you for money the day before. Well, I I don't have no money. And I, and I actually read her outside. I said, don't ever ask nobody to give me money unless yeah. I ask for myself. 
I said, because I don't like that. I get very, that, I get on the defensive about it. If I need money, I'll ask for it for myself. Right. And I was really upset about that because, you know, very seldomly have I, what, two, three right. times, I, I, I try to avoid the fact because I don't feel, I don't want people to think that I can't make it on my own. I, and you've known me for years, you've trashed me in print. <laughs> And, and, but I, you I know, confess to that. I, but, I, I've seen the error of my ways. I think no, I, no, no, it's not, I was no. very cruel when I was younger and more intolerant. I treated you very unfairly in the gay newspaper, and I apologize right now. Yeah, you don't have to apologize because, you know, I remember the time that we went to um, the U.N., and I was dressed in my grub of the revolutionary look, you know, the army pants, the army jacket. And there's Mr. Sylvia Ray Rivera. I and I was like, oh. No, that, that, was, that was the time that I read you, you were going to execute a puppy opposite St. Patrick's, which oh, I thought was a horrible. I was like, not me. I had nothing to do with this. It never happened, but they had, they had the humane society. It was some sort of a stunt that didn't come off. Somebody was, it was the gay ghost doing that. Oh. And, and unfortunately, we got him involved into it. That's when I said, Mr. I, I, I confess, I told you, I said, I wrote this article, and 20 times I said, Mr. Sylvia Rivera showed up wearing a dress and earrings. Mr. Sylvia Rivera with said, an army jacket, with an army coat. I said, I had Mr. Sylvia Rivera in there that I never called Mr. S anyone Mr. so many times in one article oh, my entire life. I was, I was like, I'm saying, why is he doing this to me? And I, and actually that's when, uh, you know, i Rivalry, I mean, well, my mortal, right. I would say, well, I misunderstand it. Like me, I'm going to read him every time I got. And you know, you know what one of my most embarrassing moments was? Was for the 20th anniversary when we did the lecture at the community center and you came in late. And once again, I was feeling no pain, but Randy came in late. Well, I don't see why Marsha and Sylvia had to sleep first. And I was like, that's it. I didn't I remember started. that. I didn't remember the, what it started. I just remember that you were circling around in the back room screaming at me. And I was, I, I was saying, but you're not a typical homosexual. I remember right. That I thought was my but then, but then I, But then I felt bad because I knew that you had already been, you know, taking care of Marsha and whatnot. Even Marsha and she says, but you know, Randy's been good to me. I said, well, he's been good to you. I said, but he's been reading me for years and I'm not taking it. There were many a times that I was invited to do panels. Well, Randy, I said, well, I'm not going. Randy Rick is going to be, I'm not going. I am not joining the I said, because there'll be a war. And I think the people knew that. And I think this is the theatrics that they wanted us to play against oh, they each other. Pitch you against one another if they yeah. think that you're so enemies, you know? A lot of times that I was invited, and, well, Randy Wicker's going to ask, I don't think so. I said, I'm not going there. And I would think about it. And I said, well, I should go. And then I said, but why should I do that to myself and to him? And, you know, it's a, it's a the community thrives. On I, gossip and trashing each other, and I say we are revolutionists. I say right. Randy did hit his way. I used to be an I used to be an enemy of Bob Culver's too. I tell people no. when you get older, all these things are not so important. And I think it's a real testimonial to the power of the love. Marsha B. Johnson was just living Marcia, love. Marcia that she she in a sense Marcia. brought us together. You know, I'm that. Because when I was running her funeral and I realized it was important that you speak and then we do it in a, we did it in the way of chronology when people knew her and you gave a wonderful uh, talk that day and uh, I was I like you made up that was when I did yeah, because I le because I, I left church and you know I went and had a few drinks I said well I'm going to I was with my girlfriend Terry and I said Terry I have to go speak to Randy and she's like but because even you know a lot of my friends knew who you were by me speak. I said, and that, as soon as I said, oh, he's running the funeral. I said, that bitch is running the funeral. I said, how dare he? But I was really impressed by everything that was done by you, by Bob, and mainly you because, and I just, 
I thought I had an obligation to Marsha, you know, I mean, it was a sense of respect, Marsha and her friends, and to give everybody their peace, you know. And I was like, you know, I was impressed, and I said, this man, even after, I, you know, joined, even after I did my, you know, my eulogy to Marsha, when I, and I sat there, and I was crying, and, when, and then when you got up and spoke, and I was reading what you had written, and what came from your puppy, what's the puppy's Marcia, name? Puppy. Oh. To Marsha. Oh, I was like, now this man has a heart. I said, there's no way that I can be angry at him for the rest of my life. We, we all fought in different ways for liberation. And you did it by, because you were not saying that you are that much older than me, but, you know, we're only 39. But I'm only 29. I oh! I didn't know you were older than me. Oh, well, you see. And um, it's funny. No, I'm that, 57. How old are you? Um, 44. I turned 44 in July. Oh, before. I was, I was, telling, I was telling someone what a, what a stunningly uh, good looking, uh, attractive uh, young person you were in the early 20s, uh, back in the you know, days of GAA. Oh, God, was I lovely then. Politically incorrect to say, but a real hot looking bitch. Oh! <laughs> Tell me some more. <laughs> I was cute back then. Well, but you know, the years. You still have a very, very nice, strong features in your face. You know, I was looking at a videotape that uh, Tom had shot the other day with you, and you have still have a. I still, yeah. I still hold up very well. You know, I'm surprised with all the alcohol that I've drank through the years, and well, and time to cut down on that because you can't abuse your body forever. You know. I'm going to die from alcohol, and I know it, and I'm, but at least I've stayed, I've, you know, for many years, you know, I'm part of the movement. I was shooting up dope, and nobody knew it. I shot dope in fucking City Hall when we went to do one of the, uh, for the, for the gay rights bill. I needed a fix. I went right into the woman's room, and I said, beep, and they were calling me, and I'm like, but the world doesn't know what Sylvia Rivera di did behind doors. And I'm not afraid, I'm not ashamed of anything that I've done. Actually, what, when I say these things, I say it because I don't want to see our young gays do what I've done through my life. Let's get away from this. Yeah. So where are we going to, what do you want to do? Actually, I want, I want to introduce you to John. John. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good job. Can we just, huh? Hi, how are you? Hi. And who, who, who is John? Who is John? Yeah, who's this John? John? John has a bit, has an interesting story to tell. Because. You live, you live where you live? I live right up over here. Show you his house. We'll show the house. And, um, John. I just met John a couple of months ago when I moved down here. But John is very impressive because the simple fact, may I say what I'm going to say, is that John has had football aids for the last 10 years and he still survived and, he's a, and he works these streets. And John can go into further detail on how these organizations have turned him and his lover Jim away because they are homeless and they have no place. Gee, is that true? Yeah, well, actually, uh, part of it, I haven't had full-blown AIDS for 10 years. I've had it for six years, but... Um, you, look, you look perfectly healthy. Yeah, that, that's, that's a big problem a lot of times is that a lot of times people think because you have a little size, you have a little stature, that you are healthy, but they don't realize how weak you feel a lot of times, you know. Um, or how sick, or the other things, you know, that you have. So have you gone to places like GMHC? Yeah, they've turned me down. Um, On what basis? I walked in and I said, I'm homeless, I have AIDS, and I need assistance, and they would say, there is no services available for you here. Go to welfare, go to whatever. And then I go to welfare and social security, and you get turned down all throughout that too. 
We've been homeless for the most part of eight years. My lover has AIDS dementia. Um, very, he's getting to the very serious stage now, you know, the last stage. And how long have you two been together? Eight years. Yeah. yeah. How long has he had uh, dementia? I mean, how long has it been that it's been getting really bad? Oh, really bad? The last uh, year is getting to the bad, to the bad, real bad stage. Uh, you don't have any medical care? You're not at St. Vincent's? Nowhere do you get any kind of follow-up treatment or any? Well, because of his, his form of uh, AIDS dementia, you know, AIDS dementia takes on a lot of different forms. With him, a lot of it is paranoia. And so he will not go see a doctor. He will not go... But then that is part of what's kept us alive also is because we don't take AZT, we don't take DDI, we don't take all those uh, drugs, and that's why I, I've been, I was diagnosed in 1985, and so was he when they called it HTLV-3, not HIV, you know, and so we're still alive, so I, I, I actually don't believe in taking these governmental drugs. Um, um, how about how I want to ask some other questions about other organizations real quick just to get it out of the way. How about like the People with AIDS Coalition? Because I went through this myself. I was rejected from GMHC when I had a sick lover because he wasn't officially diagnosed. He said we can't be concerned with every gay person who has a sick friend. Which to me, I won't give anything to GMHC, although I approve of the work they do. But for me, they let me down. But when I went to People with AIDS Coalition, I found a much more welcoming atmosphere. Um, the AIDS Coalition. I called them at once. People with AIDS. Oh, people, people, right? Okay, that one. Okay, that one. Um, I called them once, and they told me I should I should get a, a social worker representative to work for me to try to get in with them. But they don't understand how hard it is when you're watching someone that has AIDS dementia. You can't run all over the city doing all these things. I, I took care of two people that died of AIDS, so I, I know what you're talking about. It's a full-time job, and with no help, I can't imagine. And, and, and of course, uh, every move you make, you want to know exactly what you're doing, what, why, why we're going there. And if there's the slightest thing of, of going to a social service organization, I mean, it's, there goes the paranoia. And, and, and a, a lot of what, see those helicopters. A lot of uh, why that paranoia is so bad with social services and everything is because we've been used so many times in the past by them. You know, used we've been, in what way? We've been promised, like uh, we lived on Las Cruces, New Mexico, for a year, out in the desert in a tent with a broken-down motorcycle. And uh, actually, it sounds very romantic. Yeah, it's not when you're stuck 15 miles away from town and you're stuck in the desert with the rattlesnake scorpions and not that romantic. You know, but um, there was an organization there, if I could just remember, there was a SWAT, I think it was called. I don't remember what it stands for, but SWAT. And it was an AIDS organization. And they promised us, you know, they, I mean, they get me on Social Security, they do all this, they do all that. And after eight months, nothing. And then they even turn us down from the food bank. And we're living on the middle of the desert with. No money. You don't even have support the federal government. Some places like in Maine, just being HIV positive, you can get SSI. He has Social Security. SSI. Right. But, uh, but, you know, Social Security should be actually paying me for watching him. Because I haven't been able to hold a job because I have to watch him. You know, if you were if you were just a middle class or even poor working person, say they would be paying daycare workers to come over eight hours or sixteen right. hours a day to take right. care of him while you were away at work. Right, but the, the problem is also is that with dementia and with the paranoia that goes along with that, he wouldn't trust anyone. You know, that's the other part of it. You know? So that's one of the problems with that. No family or anything like that. How many people are there? A number of people like your lover down, or that you've run into on the homeless? There's a lot of people out here. Uh, None of them are getting any attention at all. Nobody is getting any help. There's one that lives beside us, but I, I can't say her name or even show you where he li well, actually, she lives. Um, I, uh, Janice is willing to speak and whatnot, and, and Janice has been one of our main main concerns right yeah, now. Yeah, she's a big concern right now.
But the problem is you have to remember, she might not remember this later. She has serious dementia, HIV cognitive impairment. She can't even get on welfare. She's been trying so hard. And she's gone through every appointment, everything she has to do, and they keep turning her down. Because she's always going back to the hospital and she miss, misses one appointment. And that's a... Uh, you know. That's true even to people that have it together. I mean, it's amazing if you don't have somebody to help you take care of going to the Social Security office and filling out forms and, you know, all these various things, uh, you just fall out of the loop and you have to start from base one. Right, but, but there's, there should be a, something, to, if someone's fighting for Social Security also, because they have a form of mental disability or physical disability, there should be a loophole there where they can still, you know, uh, make back. You know, if they miss an appointment, they shouldn't be automatically cut off. They, you know, I mean... You have to convince me. I've always wondered if you didn't have someone to run around. I mean, it's incredible. I'm like, they lose you in the computer if you're on welfare, or even in Social Security. Your check doesn't come, or they lose you in the computer. And, I mean, a lot of people that are sick don't have the energy to run down, to sit all day in a welfare office, to see their social worker, to get things straightened out. It's like Sylvia. She did everything she was supposed to do, but the last one piece of paperwork, she got to cut off. I got to start all over again. I'm trying to get. She just found out the other day. Public assistance. And well, I've always said that they make welfare so hard and such a problem to get that if you could do anything else in the world, you wouldn't go through the changes they put you through for the little bit of money they give you. And, and you know, it's not like you know. I, I know that a lot of people feel that, you know, that there are a lot of people, and I know that there's a lot of people that abuse the system. I have worked from the age of 14. Marsha and I worked at the same company, Charles Restaurants, for years together. She was, a, she was the grand queen waitress, and I worked in the office. I was an accounts payable clerk. And actually I started off as a messenger boy picking up all the guest checks. And then I started, I, I said, well, I don't want to be doing this all my life. So I had people show me how to be an accounts payable clerk, which when I left the company, I was actually learning to be a bookkeeper and a CPA. But Marsha and I worked together for a lot of years. But what I wanted to say before, being that we were talking about AIDS and whatnot, is that I've been, I work with John, and what we call work is like when we go out and try to pick up cans or find something that's valuable to sell, is that John, I, I thought, you know, he was joking with me, but John, does get run down very easily and now I'm seeing different factions of what AIDS does to people because he'll I have to rest for a little while and we'll sit and we'll bullshit for an, you know a half hour and one and says okay now I'm ready but it it hurts to see that people are not being helped this is my whole... What, what do you think would be the most important thing? I mean, there are all kinds of things. I mean, besides, say, financial support, would just having food delivery, but would having something like God's Love We Deliver come here and give you hot meals every day or, or twice a day? That would help partially. Partially that would help because that's, that's one big thing every day is it's just getting the money to get food, you know? But that's just one big thing. But also, there's... Uh, you know, there's, there's other expenses we have here. Um, I mean, everything we do basically costs money. We're, we're pretty... Like what else? What, what else? what else? What else would you, next to food, what would be the next thing you'd like to get here? Um, a way of heating our houses, you know. Winter's coming. Um, some kind of an indoor heating. I've, well, would that be safe here, or would it be yeah, stolen? You can get... Well, there's always, see, on this side of the camp here, we, we don't even deal with that over there, because that's, I don't know if you told them yet. I did. You go that, right that's all the crack addicts over there, Tom, and we don't deal with them. But now, if they knew you had some nice warm heaters over here, wouldn't those crack addicts be crawling over the wall to get them? Well, we always, there's always someone here watching someone else's camp. We always have that agreement. And um, so it's, it's this camp here, my camp, and the next camp up there, 
and the next one up there, there's always someone sitting outside watching if everyone else is gone, so we can watch. Why don't we, you want to go up and we go up? Sure. sure. Why don't we do that and we'll see, uh, yeah. make a know, tour? I'm really glad I... No, I'm really glad you, you I can't, I'm very glad I met you no, because, because you I didn't know. You have these kerosene heaters. Yeah. But not yeah. only that. Well, we can say that up there. It's, yeah. it's, like, it's, it's not the fact of staying here for the winter, Randy. Right. And what's bothering me is that John no and Jim like right and. Well, you have nowhere to go, right? And, no. And Janice and. Who's got a second? And though? here, we'll Dying. share this. But, um. I want I, I have to see something done for them. It's not for me, because I have somewhere to go. I think I, I can find a place to go, but I can't see them surviving another winter out here. I tell you, I'm, I'm flabbergasted because, I mean, I, I consider myself very aware on all these AIDS issues, and uh, it just didn't dawn on me that, that uh, there'd be no support at all. You know, I figured that even the homeless uh, would be getting, you know, immediate SSI and, and uh, medical care. You're right up to the, uh, what, what is it, the, uh, the gay, 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 gay community center, walk right up there and ask what kind of, what kind of uh, support do you have for us? Uh, they give away... So well, they give. Right down. They, right the they, they do give food out. I think Metropolitan Community Church. Don't they have a food pantry? They give out food uh -huh. one day. A week? They well, moved up to 36th Street. Now yeah. the Reverend Pat, through the Reverend Ramirez, which you met at at the Imperial Queens <coughs> meeting last month, <coughs> turned me on to the Reverend Pat. Now Reverend Pat has been on vacation. She came back two weeks ago. I have called her several times on this issue. They have a building. They have somewhere where, what my thing is, is... I know they give out food because of Brendan Fay, who used to work for me. He worked with them, and he was telling me about giving out... He, he had the attitude, well, there's no reason to be hungry. They can go up and get a package of... Not everyone can go up. People are sick. You have uh, one person up there, there right there, now. There's a lot They're of so mentally out of it, she'll never remember. She can't even remember where the water pump is every day to go get water we, every day. We, and, you know, you know? And, and my whole yeah, thing is, is that I, I don't to... want to see. I may spend the winter out here for the simple fact that if I can't see them off the street, why should I go get shelter for myself? Because right now, I have to prove a point as a Stonewall but, veteran. But hurting yourself doesn't do us no good. I will you know always. That. Sylvia can make a lot of noise. Let's go on up yes. and. She can make noise, I'll tell you that. And that's important, making noise. Don't I think we're going to get rain. No, it's not much. It's starting to rain. Huh? Huh. You better cover so, your camera lens. It's starting to rain. I don't worry about it. I've, I've, I, uh huh? Yes, I did. It's inside. Um, it's safe. We're always here. My whole thing right now is that I cannot see them staying here. And if I find a comfy place to go and live, which I've been offered, is to leave them out here. These. Th they're all, like I said, they're my kids, they're children, because they are younger than I am. How old are you? 34. Let me get a piece of cardboard for your camera. Okay? This is our living room. This is the living room quarters over here. Barbecue cookout? Oh, yeah, we cook. We cook. Uh -huh. In between both camps, we do very well. And this help you? just to keep the rain off the land. And you know, we, we, we do manage to survive. And now you want to tell me about this is, this is your... Uh... This is my home. It's not clean, so I'm not going to show you the inside. Oh, <laughs> but, oh, but this is our living room here. Well, this is very formal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I, I, I uh, matching velvet chairs. They say these people are poor. I, it looks nicer than some of the stuff I have in my house. Huh? That's, that's our stove over there. We cook off the barbecue. I'm just going to cut. charming. Okay. Yeah. And my, my partner lives over here, but he's not here right now. Uh-huh. Um, I forewarned him, so he didn't want to be here because of the paranoia. Right. So... What is the relationship you have with the people in, in here? Do they ever? Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty good, usually because I, I, I watch the cars at night. Oh. So I've caught in about uh, three or four people actually breaking into their cars. And uh, I've gone over to the security desk over there and let them know. So, oh. so it's pretty good. They, you know. Free watchmen. Yeah. It's, they should actually have security out there, but then I guess if they did, they'd probably close up the fence and not let us through. So we're, we're free security, you know. But the guys that work here, they appreciate us, you know. This is your kitchen? Yeah, this is our kitchen. It's a mess again, like I said, but I haven't cleaned it up. But You do, you do cook a lot of cooking here or just occasionally? Three meals a day. I make sure he eats three meals a day, you know. It's... He has to have proper nutrition, so it's, it's, that's a, it's hard to find fresh food, fresh food, fruit, um, fresh, uh, you know, fresh vegetables. It's hard to find that, you know. Um, how long have you been here for how long in this location? Uh, well, we started here, what was it, last year? In... Well, no, I actually told them that you built Terry's house. We built all these houses. You built Terry's we, house, then you built our house. Right, I you're built the a... founder. You're the president. <laughs> you're the mayor. She's the mayor. Uh, Sylvia is just a, a, a just a, an honorary guest. Right? I'm an honorary guest. That's what it is. <laughs> you kind of look like a mayor, to tell you the truth. I well, I need was, one of those big red something. ribbons, you know, <laughs> with a big buckle on there. Doesn't make us 14 carat. <laughs> for for, for but, Shady uh, Brook uh, Lane. <laughs> Co-op co co Incorporated. <laughs> what, what would you give for a key to the uh, city? I mean, there are no keys here, right? Probably a condom. <laughs> <laughs> a condom. <laughs> but, um, uh, we, you know, you have to make it the way you can. And, and if the social services aren't there for you, see, a lot of people are too sick, mentally ill, or physically sick to even go as far as we have. How much can you make going out and picking up cans in a day? Say that you're able to, that your friend isn't tying you down. If we have a good day, maybe ten dollars, so. huh? And, and that's if we split it between ourselves. So it's five dollars a day, and that five, my five dollars goes between feeding me and Jim for three meals a day. Well, you know? what we do is we combine between two camps and we try when there aren't arguments between the two camps. Because, you know, um, gay people are, it's not gay people, everybody argues. You know, I, I don't think that a lot of uh, gay people ever think of gays being homeless and living, you know, in lean-tos like this. A, a lot of times, you know, a bunch of gays are all, they're all, in, you know, down in Pensacola, Florida, at the big disco, uh, flashing the new uh, sportswear. I see you pushing a shopping cart down here in the village. And we are in the village. And, uh, and we're in and the that, middle of the gay gathering right. of New York. But they'll too. see you pushing a shopping cart. They know you're gay because they've seen you around for years, okay? But because they think you're home, because you're homeless, suddenly it's because you're bad. You've done something wrong. That's the way they think. You know, they look at you like, well, maybe you're an old hustler and you ripped off too many tricks or you've done all that stuff, you know? And uh, that's the way they look at you. And they, they walk away. They turn their back on you. But if they could just understand what we're saying now, that's not the story, you know? The only reason I'm homeless now is because my friend has such bad paranoia that, that every time we walk into an apartment, I mean, we'll raise the money, we'll save the money to get into an apartment, but one or two days there and the paranoia is so bad, he has to leave. Well, of course, I'm going to go with him. I'm so, going to go with him, you know? Wherever he goes, I'll well, go. Yeah, I, I, I sent him someplace to make sure he's all right. 
So yeah, um, he uh, basically, I think he got paranoid because he got a little paranoid and he got a little upset. So yeah, I think we should. I think we should. I mean, I just was down here today exploring, but uh, might be interesting. You know, I'm going to call God's lovely deliver. I mean, you know, we can do a little test of some of these groups and find out what the. Uh, apparently, it seems to me you're just on a on a, a loop somehow that you know. Because I mean, they give. They, I'm sure that I'm sure that that the people that run these organizations, a lot of them are volunteers. I know people that volunteer, and I'm sure that it would be more rewarding to run down here with some some meals for people. And they said they said you had to have an address. I said, well, I have. It just doesn't have a number. <laughs> you know. Yeah, we need a number. Three ninety nine half here. May maybe. Yeah, right? no. that, that would be interesting to test our gay city councilman, who's HIV positive, and ask him if there's a way they can pass a bill or introduce legislation to give an address. Yeah. There has to be. I mean, this is a part of New York. This is something. I mean, I don't know it. It could be given a number and a name. Because the, the other problem is, department, they have an address. They get mail delivered every day. But the other problem is, that number A. Yeah. Just put a big a but the it. other problem is, is now that that uh, you know they're threatening to have us kicked out at any time. Now who is they? Well, we're not sure exactly who they is. We believe it's the city, but the signs up there is there say the Hudson. Well, they Conservancy. Were, you know, did you no, right. did you notice? The We're having a meeting. We could go there. Yeah, because they're planning on on on, on kicking us out. Was that who they morning. were? There were suits, yeah, and, and they were pointing and whatnot. See, they're planning on on clearing this all out. Now you see how clean we keep it here. We, you know, try. we try. We try. It's hard. Well, where but, would you go? I mean, is there an option where you? Well, we'd be sleeping on a we'd be sleeping on a on on a bench step somewhere. But there are various. There are a number of little encampments like this around New York, right? Yes. Yeah, are. but but they're but mostly is, like that over there. This crack is, Haven. This is crack. Uh, well, you know, we, I can't I can't haven. subject him to Crack Haven. And I think um, this is something else. I think people never think this, of in terms. This is, this is um, this is the gay community of the homeless people. This is the only uh, encampment of gay homeless that you know. That I know of right now. I mean, it's not Crack Haven, you know. I'm just uh, that's mostly gay over there on that pier, but right. that's a lot. Down towards that end, and yeah. that, oh, that's that way is straight, and down towards yeah. that end. Is there is there a division in other homeless encampments between people that are like Crack Haven and people that really aren't that just are on hard times that are trying to hold it together and improve themselves? I've looked, you know. What do you find generally? It's all this just is where we came. I'm this just is saying. This you know. This is where. But in well, other, we what I'm saying is that you find the same division in other encampments where there are people that are, are crack addicts and other people that aren't, and there's a division where they try to, like, keep away from one another? Not that I've seen, no. Here we have a fence we have between a the fence two of us. And, and, um, we have a fence and, and we, we, we you know. try to disassociate with everyone that's into the heavy drugs. Because all it is is make us look bad. It makes yeah. the community look bad. Here's still in that we're homeless, but we're worrying about keeping the image of the gay brothers. That's what those people do in the neighborhood. You understand the people out there that are paying a thousand dollars for a studio. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they have, if they have. Drugs I invite them for one week to try this. Smoking crack and turning tricks in their hallways. They say it's all coming they from come, that encampment. They, they don't differentiate the whole. Besides this side. Right. And that side. Well, actually, you know, the only thing that, the, that was great when the New York Times article came out was. When was that? How long ago? Uh, do you still have the article? No, it was a the it was a Sunday Metro section front page. Uh, it was, it was like called the uh, uh, the He She's uh, Shanty Town of the He She's or something right. like that. How long ago? It was in, this is end of oh, uh, a couple of months ago. Before uh, before the Fourth of July, so it came uh, out like right after Gay Pride, in between Gay Pride and the 4th of July. Right. And actually, our side of the pier, even though they referred to that, our side of the pier, they brought up the, the colors, the, the American flag, the colors, the gay colors, and the, gay the, flag. the upper we were well, called no, right? no, the upper crust or the no the, no the, uh, uh, comfortably situated the homeless <laughs> with the canopy. isn't it wonderful I mean when you read stories about yourself I mean it's amazing because 
people, I've begun reading stories about events that I was at and not realize that it was an event I had attended until I got to about the tenth paragraph. Well, the, 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 the problem with they actually he, gave even, us but a the very, problem was very nice, yeah. you know, print up on our side, but it's still referred to. Well, the, it was it was maybe half a paragraph, yeah. but but the same, but the but the the real thing was after that that media attention. Right away, we had problems. Right away, you had Boom. well, immediately we never had that before. Suddenly, you have helicopters flying down. The very next day, flying down, looking around, now, taking they, I, photographs. Oh, really? You think these are police or or state agents? Well, it could or be because they, they, they could be ex expecting that we're all drug people or whatever. You know, I don't know. But also, uh, you had police pulling up and starting to walk right through here all the time, and, and it's a form of harassment. They might not be kicking you out or whatever, but just the intimidation is a form of harassment, you know, for a homeless person. But they what would happen if, so, say somebody went crazy over there and came over here and attacked you and was killing Sylvia, could you run and would a cop come if you ran over across the street and said, please, my friend's being murdered, would a, a no, cop actually, respond he, it, and come John over? John would kill. We, uh, John no, I'm asking, no, no, I just want to know, John have you ever? Kill. No, I, maybe, but. No, have no. you ever, I'm saying, do you, do you feel that the the police are there, that if there was a real real horrible thing happening, well, the police know, but don't do you really think, would they just show you uh, away? They'll probably take, they, you know, maybe, maybe they'll come fast, maybe they'll take their time, I don't know, but if, if someone came over here, my partner, who I love very much, was hurt, was, was getting hurt, or being threatened, uh, i protect him. Well, that's understandable, I mean, but I'm just saying you don't I'll feel. In other words, you don't you don't feel that there's I'm any. I'm going to wait for him for him to so get you hurt. Feel the police are there, as a friend of mine said, to protect property, not people. What was that? About? Yeah. Well, what happens is you have. What one? You know. Or what? Let me put it the way I think at it, and the way the way we we all I think have to live through it. You, we go out there and we work picking up cans or whatever, but we're all constantly being watched and harassed by the police while we're doing that. Okay because they think maybe we're going to steal something, maybe we're going to do whatever. But then, the next minute, you know, and, and a lot of times they'll stop and they'll check your ID and they'll do all this, you know. But then the next minute, you know, the next day, you have the homeless police coming through here going, well, we care about you, and we're, do, you know, hey, give me a break, make up your mind. You said the homeless police? Yes, it's a homeless uh, outreach unit. Right, yeah. They come through and... We've had arguments with them also. We've actually you kicked them out. Me. We've actually kicked I've them out of here once. Nice we told them how, how full of it they were, you know? You know, I mean, because they're, they're, they're full of it. There's an example talking about it's a waste what of the police money. And, and services will do for the homeless, and especially if they know that you're gay. And the incident, Let's walk down and talk to Janice. Okay, she's but, expecting us yeah. now. But right. Janice got ill one one week, and it was she was sick for two or three days, and we finally ended up calling the emergency ambulance. And my friend John, who was sleeping in the house while 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 you taped, had to ca throw her over his back because they wouldn't even come in through that fucking hole in the fence to take her for medical attention and and this queen was dying she was completely dehydrated and and this is Janice bumping bumping thumping shaking bake <laughs> but but this is Randy Wicker and you know Tom from before but um it was a, it was a heartbreaking experience because to see my boyfriend jump up and grab her and throw her over his shoulder, they wouldn't come here for her. And then they tried to break her neck as they were wheeling her out. Where I had to jump in front of the the ambulance where John was there already. Right. Yeah, we're young. And I got we got all that was abuse. the information now. But all we were worried about was that she got the proper medical but help. She did, she did get taken to a hospital, though, she right? She did, yeah, but, except but, that we couldn't find her for seven was, days, but we, we found her. We couldn't find her for seven days because the hospital didn't, wouldn't, had, didn't have her, her. Her sister, who's a police officer, is the only one who was able to find her. 
through the do you, computer. Do you have a doctor you can go to if you're feeling real sick? No, I don't. I have a family doctor, but he's very expensive, and I cannot afford him. No. Tried going to any of the clinics to get continuing like, care when you have problems? No, I really haven't. No, I really haven't, to be truthful with you. No. And I suffer with seizures very bad. No. So that time she was so sick. Take the Latin? Yeah. And um, when I was in the hospital, um, the um, nurse there, she um, referred me to a, um, um, what do you call those people that uh, work for the welfare? Social a social worker, that's right. She referred me to a social worker there. And the social worker, um, uh, uh, let me see, how can I say this? They um, gave me Dilantin, but they said they wouldn't do it again. And um, next week I have to go to uh, fill out papers. Um, they didn't give you pills to take every day? Yes, they did. Oh, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah. And they said they wouldn't do it again. Um, is in St. Louis, and she has no insurance. Because right. she's been cut off for welfare. And um, next week I'm supposed to go back to um, the hospital so I can fill out some papers so I can try to get back on welfare again. And that's what I'm trying to do right now. To How get many seizures have you had? Um, I've had quite a few. I really can't remember. I've had quite a few. It's just and, starting to heal up now. So and nice. as I get older, yeah. they're getting worse. I, I, I had took care of somebody that had seizures. They're, they're terrible things to go through. They can be very serious. And that's how my face got all <coughs> scarred up from falling down, um, you know, and things like that. I usually prescribe her medications. I hold her medications and give it to her, usually. Well, my friend, he, he would feel them coming on. He had this awful feeling, and he would run and take a Dilantin, and that would the keep last, it from coming on. The last one when we were at the pantry at um, what is told me that if you have a seizure, you're most likely to have another seizure in the next 24 hours. And you want to keep that in mind, so if you ever have one seizure, it's a very good chance. Yeah, they, it's a much greater chance to have in the next 24 hours than any other time. And then, you know, uh, we, we lost her, what was it, last week? week before last. Yeah. We lost her for three or four days. She had completely forgotten where she was, where she lived, where she was going. She didn't know she who didn't recognize she was. us when we saw her out in the streets. And we lost her and we were and we uh, when we saw her on the she, street she didn't recognize us. She's one of our main concerns right now. You know, we all worry about each other. But Does your memory come back though after as a seizure recedes, do you find you start remembering? After a few days. And like I stated earlier, um, as I some of as I get er, uh, older, they're getting worse. How old are you? Some of them. I'm 39. I'm 39. Some of them come back. Not all of them. How old? I'm 39. Oh, come on now, well, we child. We got it on another tape. We got, we got on tape now, now right? Right. There, uh, she was, she forgot. She forgot the last five birthdays. I was she born does, in 56. She does forget. And we do worry about her. And basically, um, once again, when it comes to food and whatnot, whoever has, we all try to feed one another. And How long have you lived here? She's one of our main ones that we, we, we make sure that she eats I'm something because of her. I've lived here quite a while now. I've lived here quite a while. And, um, a year or two? Um, I'd say about two years or maybe through more. Yes, through, yeah. yeah, through the winter, through the winter. And, um, I uh, usually go garbage picking to find sweaters and things like that to like, so I can stay warm in the winter because I know the winter's coming on, you know. And um, I have a lot of sweaters and coats and things like that to take me through in case I can't get on welfare or something like that. <coughs> but uh, I have to get on welfare and um, like my girlfriend stated, you know, they're concerned about me and uh, they really would like me to get on welfare and I, I have to get on. I have to really get on. Besides welfare, there's programs like uh, SSI, which is a federal program that might be easier because a lot of the welfare programs are getting very hard now with the Republican mayor and everything. And well, all I have you tried getting a social worker at, at uh, gay men's health crisis or anything? No, I haven't. No, I haven't because I really don't know how to go about things like that. I really don't. Um, Randy, um, I'm trying to cut her off and whatnot. Like I said, you know, you, you, obviously just by talking, you know, she's not, I'm not trying to put her down or anything, but um, We've been she so is hard. also, it's hard. Besides being gay, she's a drag queen. Oh, you're not a woman. 
You had me fooled. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't get now that. She's oh, a, now she's, oh, she's really going to think oh, she's the grand diva. Now you know who's diva, diva right? <laughs> now you know who's grand diva. But uh, <laughs> it's hard, you know. It's always been hard <clears throat> for DQs, TVs. You're HIV? Yes, I am. And and you know, and she and she has a lot of problems, you know, and it's and it's. But you know, you know this term because I've I live with people that they call it dementia. That's a, a very bad term because it's not that you're demented. It's just that it's, it should be called confusionitis. Yeah. You just get a little yeah, bit. Yeah, confused. She gets she, she gets confused. Let's see now, I've never heard of that before. Now, um, one day, Sylvia and myself was talking, and we were just talking uh, in general, and she was telling me about how bad I was getting, and that. Um, that they could lose me for uh, a while and they're very concerned about me. And I think that's wonderful that they're concerned about me because um, my family lives out in Queens and they can't, you know, come over here all the time to look after me, so. Do they come over here sometimes? No, they don't. Never? I have, never, or they never came once? No, I have to usually go over there to visit them. And uh, my brother lives in the Bronx and um, I wouldn't take you in if you were really sick. I mean, in the sense that you were bedridden. We would, but see, they have my my foster, my foster mother. She has um, a lot of foster kids to keep money coming in because she has a home. And um, I uh, really never wanted to go live out there because, like, uh, the foster boys. I want them to be straight. I don't want them to pick on my pick up my um, gay ways. I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right to force my uh, lifestyle. I don't think I don't think you really. I don't think I think people you couldn't you know I don't think they would be affected by your being there really. My ways and I. Is this putting on a dress? I really don't know, but I'm not going to um, uh, be around them. I don't think it's right to force my lifestyle on someone. It's not right. It's just not right. It's just not. Nobody, most people don't want to go back living with their mother or foster mother because they always treat you like a child. Even though you're 40 years old, to, to them you're always a little baby, you know? And she's always treated me wonderful. Oh, yes, she's always treated me wonderful. But um, I just don't think it's right, you know? It's just not. Because, like, every time I go over there, they look, like, up to me. And um, that's when I say to myself, it's just not right for me to live out here. And my brother, he lives in the Bronx. He's gay too, but he's very suit and tie. He works for the post office. And um, he would take me in, but I really don't, I really don't want to live with him. I just want to just be on my own. I just do. I think everybody wants to be on their own, really. I think it's very understandable. Glasses, and um, someone stole my gold frames and um, it's hard for me to see at times. Have you gone to the, you know, the drug stores, they have glasses that you can try on uh, up to certain powers that uh, work as well as optometrist glasses. Um, it's only $12, I'm saying, but it's 12 or $15, but I'm saying if, you, if, you, if you, you're worried about getting your glasses, you don't have to go to an optometrist. You might be able to find a pair of glasses in a, in a, in a drug store for $10, $12 That's at work. Well, I know, but I'm just saying it's a, a lot less money than two or three hundred dollars that I, I you pay to go to have an optometrist. I can't hear. You can't hear? Okay. I see. Um, but like once I get on welfare, um, I'm going to take my Medicaid card to a hospital and l let them test my eyes so I can get a pair of frames because it's a must. It's a must. It really is. There's directions on the medicine without eyeglasses, right? And that's bad. That's one problem she had one time was that uh, she was overtaking her medicine. That's when I decided to take over her medicine and start dispensing it to her because she was taking too much. She didn't realize, and too much. And that's one of the times she ended up going to the hospital. You know. Milligrams. Well, she used to have she used to have an advocate out here checking over her all the time. Okay, well, I mean, you know, I wish you well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And this is Shady, like I said, this is Shady Brook. Shady Brook Park? No, Shady Brook Lane. As Shady Brook Lane. 
And we have that, so we have the name. All we have to do is get the, the city councilman to give have a, a give you a number. This is shade. Don't fall in the hole. <laughs> Not with my camera, anyway. We do have beautiful. We have beautiful. <laughs> right, don't fall with my camera, no. Did you find your camera the other no, day? No, I haven't. You lost the camera? No, it, was, it's, it it's probably was, I hope so. But, they um, may have laid it out on the counter, and in the morning, you know, John is not very bright. He could have let somebody walk in and walk off with it, you know, if it was just laying there. I thought yeah. I put it away. I thought you did, too, because I remember the last picture. You took the last picture. I could have sworn I did, right. That's why I'm so twisted. I think I couldn't get into the drawer. The dog was blocking the drawer, and I think I, I must have tucked it somewhere. But I swear I've torn the place apart. It'll, it'll probably turn up when I move a box or something. But um, once again, you know, going back... You, you spoke with Janice, and you see that she's not all here. And she's one of my main concerns for the simple fact that um, she reminds me so much of Marsha at times, you know. And she looks at the river when she loses her mind, and all I do is sit, I said, please don't jump into the fucking river. Don't jump into the river. I mean... And like I said, we lost her about a week or two weeks ago. For three or four days, she was gone, and we couldn't know. Let me get on this side, because I can't. We didn't know where she was. And, and it concerned us. And when we did see us, like John said, is that she ran away from all of us. She didn't know who she was. She, when she did come back, she was like, well, thank God. God, I'm home, and I'm like, well, where are you? I'm in the village somewhere. Well, who am I? She says, your girlfriend that always feeds me, and all the other girlfriends feed me. And I said, well, who the fuck am I, bitch? And she finally started snapping. She says, oh, you're Sylvia. I said, well, thank God you at least, because I, I said I was going to have you committed. No, no, no. After, see, I can tell you, I lived with someone, didn't know me uh, for a couple days in the hospital. But slowly they come back. When you have a seizure, it sort of wipes out memory. And she may remember, he remembered his sisters towards the end. He knew them. He loved them. He had the same feelings, but he couldn't remember their names. He'd say, oh, you, you. And he couldn't remember the name. They said, well, who am I, George? He'd say, you're my sister. But he couldn't remember his sister's well, name. So it's not a, like, it's not quite as bad as... We didn't want to have her, you know, but it's just that we didn't want her to hurt herself or anything, you know. Because after she did come back to camp, as we call it, camp, um, as it was the fact that she was still so out of it that she was looking at the river, looking at the sun, and I'm sitting here in our encampment, and I'm like, oh, Lord, so the last things that I remember from w before Marsha uh -huh. passed on was that that's what she was doing, was looking at the river and looking she at She saw the, her dead father in the bottom of the river. And that's all I, all I keep worrying about, and I'm like, I can't have this happen to me again. What, what Now, th there's a wall over there, but what about those people over in that section? Are, are they part of the other section, or are they um, part of this section? They're actually... A part of both sections. They, um, we get along very well with them. And unfortunately, they're in, you know, to the crack and whatnot. But, you know, we share amongst ourselves because when they find food, they bring us food, and when we find food or well, whatever food is given to us, we all share it. One thing that, that I wonder about that, say that you were to get portable heaters for these two or three little houses here. It's a cold winter night. I mean, wouldn't you find that all these people would then be like knocking on your door to keep warm? Actually, you know, like, you know, once again, you know, like I said, I don't plan to be here for the winter. I'm saying, but I'm saying that, and it's it, given the situation. That it it would, it would, um, we basically, once again. It should be the we, closest warm spot. We, you know, the end of my house is the dividing line between the world, that world, and our world. Our world is 
we want to keep basically to ourselves as gay people and proud gay people, even though we're homeless. But we want, we don't want nobody to bother us. And like I once again say, yes, we all drink down here on this side, but we're not into heavy drugs. And, and that's the main focus point that people got to realize that just because you're homeless, we're not, we're not sick people. You know, a couple of things I, I meant to ask you, I never knew. How did you ever, uh, how did you happen to meet Martin Duberman? He made, he featured you very heavily in the Stonewall um, book. Meeting Martin was, um, if you remember correctly, well, that's right, you don't remember that one from, from the Gay Community Center on the 20th anniversary. It was, um, oh, God, David I. Sayers tape from the Remembering the Stonewall, Mike something, right. was originally supposed to do the book on the Stonewall. And somehow Martin got a hold of my name, and, it, and that's... Well, you met him then at the 20th anniversary. Yeah, and, and he came, you know, he came many a times to my house in, um, in Cherrytown and did the interview and whatnot. How long ago did you lose your house in Tarrytown? It's about three years now. And um, one what thing happened to your lover. You 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 had a you, you I and, still I still see him. Actually, um, Frank and I, you know, Frank and I have a. We've had good. We're going on 16 years in November. We've had eight years of non-sex, but we we love each other. We're very good friends, and when I need a little change, I can go and see him. And he comes down and he visits. You met him at at, at the Imperial Queens meeting the last time. He spent four days down here. Except that um, right Does now. He stay? Does he stay here with you or? Yeah, he stayed. He stayed here, but um, right now it is the whole thing is that um, his family doesn't approve of the fact that we've been together, and they got the AIDS phobia and whatnot. And is he healthy? Yeah. You know, you know, I, you know, I always thank the Lord, you know, I don't care what anybody says, I know there's a Lord. All through the years that I've hustled, and even when I was shooting dope and whatnot, and that's why I always, every six months or every eight months, I go get tested, because I know that the AIDS virus was out longer than what they say. And I know that for a lot of years of my life, even in the movement, which nobody knew, which you didn't even know, thank God, because you would have trashed me. <laughs> well, maybe uh, rightly so. Yeah. I mean, we can't but, have drug addicts running around being big guns in the movement. <laughs> but I was shooting dope, and now, have you stopped that completely? Oh yeah. My biggest. How did you? How did, was that hard to do? Or how, what? What caused you to stop? What enabled you to stop? You know what happened was that you know, as a matter of fact, the same incident that I I discussed about when Marsha busted into our house where Terry was, that I was, we were all living, as we always did, you know, there was 10 of us living in a, in, in a one-bedroom apartment, but we came home and we found this queen that we called Lady June dead, and she had died actually from methanol poisoning because she was trying to kick the habit, and she her system wasn't used to alcohol and methanol. The rest of us were, but um, so that like, was a wake-up call for you. It was a big wake-up call because between Marsha and myself, it took between going to Philadelphia and trying to find her family and coming back on the bus, on the Greyhound bus from Philly, I said, Marsha. I have Lady June's aunt's number in the Bible. Because one thing that I was very good at is like, everybody write down your real boy's name, your family, 
I don't care. Have, you have uh, Phyllis's number? I have, I have Janice's mm -hmm. number, yeah. And I was like, um, but drawing, the, you know, when you come home and find somebody laid out on your couch dead, it's a complete. But Marsha and I spent two to three days in Philly trying to find a family. And on the way home, I said, well, I, wait. We can. Did you finally find the family? Yeah, I did get a hold of the family here, and the family came and claimed the body. And it was a hurting feeling, and then I just decided, you know, that it was my time to stop shooting drugs. I kept Marshall locked out of our own house for three weeks while I kicked a habit on my own. I wouldn't let nobody in the house. And Marsha understood. Because I know, from what I understand, I don't know how true it is, but through the years that I knew Marsha, and it was almost 30 years, Marsha was not into drugs and into drinking. People, I always, we always, that was something, people, we thought she had a very fragile personality and realized she had a fragile personality, as wonderful and warm as she was, and that she knew she couldn't handle any drugs or alcohol, and that's why she and didn't. People tell me now, towards the end, that she was drinking and taking drugs. Now, I don't... She, I, she inherited, somebody gave her a $2,000 inheritance, and she started going out to discos. And she always occasionally would smoke a little pot or something. Well, that but she I always did. She didn't. I think she. I think what it is is she got hold of ups or got hold of I don't know whatever they have in the in the discos. You know, suddenly because she had money, things were available to her that weren't available, and that's when she had her breakdown. It was so sad because this guy died and left her this money to help improve her life, and he almost killed her. I mean, simply because having that money ended up being a curse instead of a blessing. That's when she had her first major break breakdown. You know, it's like, you know, we say, you know, we... And what they do to you, you know, she wandered the streets of New York, they beat her up, they broke her false oh, teeth. Yeah. I mean, apparently if you're a crazy person walking the streets I mean, of New York, and people take advantage of you. I mean, they brutalize you. When I was doing well, and I used to come down to the village, and I would, and I basically used to come down just to, to find her, just so I could give her money. Just to give her money. A couple dollars, a little change. A little change for the simple fact that she would tell me if I tried I, I remember the first time that I saw her after like two years after I had moved upstate, up to Terrytown and whatnot. And I came, I said, well, girl, I got some money. I said, and I tried to slip her a 50. She looked at me, she said, oh, no, Miss Thing. I don't need that. Because you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give it away. Just give me a couple of dollars, a little change. And it bothered me, even though I went home, I was like, and, I, and Frank was with me. That's the first time that Frank came down to the village and he met Marsha and he said, but why didn't she take the money? I said, because this is the way Marsha is. Marsha knows what she's capable of doing. And she knows that if she took that money, she told me, I would give it away. So what I ended up leaving her was $10. I said, well, here. I, did you want a drink? I'll just buy me a sandwich, girlfriend. Fine, I bought her a sandwich. Well, here's ten dollars. Listen, you know, I, I I really enjoyed seeing the situation here today, and I think it's time for a little media blitz. We know a little bit about media blitzes. I think that the gay newspapers in New York should do really articles, and I think that the organization should be confronted, and there should be a little uh, con. A little noise made, and that the situation should be changed. You know, better. What, you know what, Randy? Like, what we can is, still raise hell, can't we? You, oh, yes, think I you can. could stay sober for a couple days? I could stay sober, and I fucking go. I got to go to bat to hell for, for the community now, because, and I'm glad that you have come down and seen. I know that you had mentioned it and mentioned it, and I'm glad that Tom and yourself came down. Tom has been down several times, and I'm glad that you came down. And even the other day when you said it, I said, well, fine, you come down. Because I want you to see, because I know you're a hellraiser as well as I am. And right now, I've closed so many networks in the past, and now the networks have to be open for the simple fact that you see what what this poverty is in the gay community when the gay community center is only two blocks away from here actually basically if you go one way or the other and they have 
no incline of what's going on. So we should we work together putting out some leaf. We should get some literature, just some basic, you know, information. Well, tomorrow at, at get a reprint of that article from the Times as part of I it. I have that. You do? I have. Um, uh, well, I like to get the a the she one I don't have. I think, well, um, maybe Vinny might have it, but um, that, the, that? the thing is that tomorrow I even told Queen Allison from the Imperial Queens, another Stonewall bitch, that I was going to bring this up. I w I'm demanding a meeting with the director of the community center to know what's going on. And not only that, like I told okay, Queen I Allison, I think and I have to go and I have to attack Jeremiah tomorrow, I tell you, I is think that the organizations are not doing enough. Well, listen, we're gonna, I'm going to make copies of this videotape. And with copies of the videotape, they have no excuse for not knowing, because uh, through the eyes of this camera, they are be, going to be shown what's going on. It's and then if they don't uh, react or do something about it, the onus is on them. It's, it's like, you know, um, David Isaiah, when he first, you know, sent Michael Musto to me and whatnot, he says, it has to be known what's going on. Did Michael do some good writing about the well, situation he, here? He didn't come here. He did it up in Yonkers. But actually, now that I'm, like, you know, working with you and working with other people, I w I'll get a hold of him and I'll make it. And he'll come down and do an article on this. But it's up to a lot of, it's like, you know, John. Listen, when you want to raise hell with a group, I mean, I'm, hey, I'll be I'm, there to, I'll be there wanting to stand up on the other side of the room so they can't just shut you up and ignore it's, it. We have to do something. And it's not even just the homeless social, it's the you know, big everybody. AIDS. Sure, right and here. Is, is that the, you can't have holes in the in the safety net big and, enough and, uh, and so big that this stuff goes is on. Just letting it fall. The through. community doesn't know. I don't want to defend the community because I, I I really think that we have a compassionate and good community. And I think if people, I can I can tell you myself that I have undergone somewhat of a transformation today. Coming here, I've heard about it. I've never seen it. I always look for it on the other side of the building. And that's one reason I never knew exactly where it was. You know. And in a way, maybe it's good, because my luck, I would have wandered over there, and some crack addict would have hit me over the head, and I would have lost my camera, right? That's but I think if our community knows and understands that, look, we have enormous resources, you know, with taking care of thousands of people, and I'm sure that some sort of provisions can be made to get some of the basic necessities, certainly basic medical care, uh, food support, whatever, in, into people like this that can't really uh, arrange it themselves. You know, like, you know, it's getting the basic... Even this that nonsense of not having an address, that's... I'm sorry. This is a place. This is a place. There, this is an address. I, even though it might not be recognized by the city, as far as I'm concerned, this is a spot of land on the waterfront of New York. There, this place should have an address. You know, in other words, this is, this is a place, and every place has an address. And Seems to me that that's... Didn't that seem like a natural right? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, and, like, you know... The homeless issue is one thing, but, you know, you've spoken to John, you spoke to Janice, and whatnot. These are people that don't need to be out here. They're not well, you know. John... Listen, if you need to, you can use my store as an address. You know, such and such care of... Thank you. My store, okay? So if you need it with some of these bureaucrats of social work, just let me know, so I, and I'll start a file there, and we'll... Because it's important, because, you know, it's going to be cold out here for these right. kids, you know. The community center, that's something the community center could do. They could supply uh, an address, you know what I mean? Or, or a, a center where people could get checks and mail, you know what I mean? That's the kind of thing I think the community center would be well. I'll certainly call them up and suggest it. And, you know, we'll have time tomorrow. You have to meeting. think of other things like that. Say, you know what it is? You have to work through these things. What, who can do what? Now, I think that's a very simple and reasonable demand. And if they say no, I want to know why not. You know, I mean, if they, they, they certainly should be able to help homeless people get basic benefits, you know, that are gay. I mean, that's part of their obligation to the community, not just raising money from the Founders Society or whatever, where you give $1,000 a year. I know. Um, someone was telling me yesterday that we could pick at the Founders Society. You know, they give a thousand dollars a year to be a member of the the, oh, the really? well, platinum circle, huh? I can do a lot with I imagine. 
it would it would sort of be you know because it's community center i like the community center but they're kind of bureaucratic you know they're kind of like well i mean let's suggest the institution or nothing against them but you know bureaucrats institutions are run by bureaucrats whether they're gay or straight institutions and i always like tweaking bureaucrats i don't care we, you know we've become so mainstream and whatnot lately you know and everything is business business and that's the way i look at it it's not like in the beginning you know, we fought for a lot of different things. And even our little, you know, the GLF Community Center was the first one. Well, you started with yeah, stars, yeah, street, yeah, trans yeah. fast, act, you and Marsh to yeah. build a holding yeah. for home. Right. And, we, and we did our thing without the help of the community once again. You know, this is what I refer to all the time is the things that Marsh and I did by the both of us hustling the damn streets to help our own without the help of the community because the community did not help us at all. You know, that's what community is, is caring for other people. And oh, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. And this is why right. when, she, when she I... When you're, I the, you're the sister that feeds her. This is our community. Fantastic endorsement of you. This is our community. Right. This is our little house. I know now if I ever get hungry that, that Sister Sylvia will take care of me. I, mean, I, will come I know. She's come good people. Eat. She's good people and she'll take care of, of, of those that need it. Right? I've been doing it for years. Right. And, you know, in Yonkers I was named Ma yeah. Sylvia by all the queens that lived in my area. I took them in. <laughs> oh, we don't want to get that ma stuff. Let's dye the hair. We'll be Sister Sylvia. Okay. <laughs> Let's take a break. I need Recording. Sylvia Rivera. Original name, Ray Rivera Mendoza. I was born in 1951. I had a mother and I had a father. In 1953, my mother decided to try to off herself. At the same time, she tried to kill me. She knew I was going to have a very hard life. And yes, I've had a very hard struggle. I tell these stories of my life because I know that my children in later years, my transgender community will understand. We have to stand up and speak for ourselves. We have to fight for ourselves. We saved their lives. We were the front liners of the so-called 1969 rebellion of the Stonewall. I don't know how long I'm going to be around, but I wanted to be told the way I feel. Sylvia and I talked about it when she was in the hospital, and really neither one of us could come up with why we, of all people, stayed friends for 33 years. I I've always said we were the oddest of odd couples, but I was in my 40s at that time. Sylvia was 19. Um, Sylvia was basically a Puerto Rican street drag queen. We didn't have transgendered people in those days. I was uh, a wasp who had uh, come out of the establishment. Uh, Stonewall was peculiar. It meant many things to many people. Here was a riot, and here, uh, for the first time, well, first time any of us were seeing uh, gays fight back. I think one of the things that impressed Sylvia most was the, um, the line of street kids doing the, the rockette, we are the Stonewall girls, because I mean, this was in total defiance. This was getting out and saying to the world, to the police, to everybody, I'm a little faggot, and it was, we are the Stonewall girls, we wear our hair in curls, we don't wear underwear, we show our pubic hair. It certainly uh, was the turning point in, in the life of Sylvia Rivera. 
the one aspect of Sylvia's activism going all the way back to 1970 in Star House was the specific issue of dealing with the homeless transgender population. And Star House came out of the organiza organization Star, which stood for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, and it was the uh, brainstorm of Sylvia, Marsha P. Johnson, and Bubbles Rose Lee. Marcia and Sylvia got a hold of this building and they were using it, it's sort of the model for Transy House here in fact, uh, as a uh, kind of collective place for the uh, trans girls that were out living on the street, you know, homeless. Marcia and Sylvia mothered them, I mean they mothered everybody, so I considered Sylvia to be my mother, everybody in this house called her ma, I mean she was... Uh, well, that's what she was. Sylvia left the movement uh, after the first three, three or four years because in this very park she had been refused the right to speak and it was right here in the rally after one of the, um, the pride marches. It was like the fourth anniversary gay march when I was beat up on stage. Go on, Betty, quiet down! What the fuck? Sylvia did grab the mic and speak, and she roared. Revolution now! Give me a G! Give me an A! Give me a Y! Give me a P! Give me an O! Give me a W! Give me an A! Give me an O! I have never seen anyone so, so lost. I mean, Sylvia's world had suddenly just collapsed. And Sylvia left the movement for 20 years. I've known Sylvia informally, you might say, since 1969, 1970, the Gay Activist Alliance. We were arch enemies for the first 22 years of the 32 years we knew one another. And that is story which I think is so remarkable. The person that I used to consider a very arch enemy or moral political enemy, someone I had no use for whatsoever, ended up becoming one of my best friends in life and literally came in here and ran my business and became one of the most special, wonderful, incredible people I ever knew. How many people have one of their worst enemies or oldest enemy become one of their best friends and saviors? Have you ever spent a winter in these, in you know, like out of doors or in an I spent, environment like this? I spent winters with um, Marsha and some of the other drag queens many years ago before Star House and drawing, you know, drawing the beginning of Star House out in the street. But it wasn't like this. This uh -huh. is like a complete new atmosphere for me. They didn't have homeless encampments in those days. We didn't. Did they? We, we slept in hallways. Or either Marsh or I had a hotel room where we snuck everybody in. You know. The pier was actually established a few years before I got here. I came down to be nosy and I moved in and took over basically as the big mother that I am. Over here, this was part of my house. This is my little segment of the house, because Vinnie and Tom live on that side. You can mm -hmm. go in the room. It's, you know, very... This is my closet where I keep my clothes, yeah. Any gowns? Yeah, all the gowns, you know, I don't need them. I was comfortable for a lot of years, you know, like I said, we owned a house. My lover and I did own a house. And actually what happened, you know, it's been like three years is when, Ma when, when I got that telegram, the marshal was dead. I mean, I lost a lot of my incentive to do anything. When she died, part of me went with her because one of our packs was that we would always cross River Jordan together. And to me, this is the River Jordan, the Hudson River. 
this is not my first time that I've hit the bottom as far as, you know, because of my drinking and whatnot, but... But what's given me a lot of incentive right now is, like, being back in the village instead of being in Westchester and keeping myself confined from what my life has always been is to fight for something. Because most of the kids here were alcoholics and people with AIDS. And that's one of the reasons that I like I stayed on for as long as I did until we got thrown out because there were people here that really needed help and the community was not here to help them. But it it hurts to see that people are not being helped. I may spend the winter out here for the simple fact that if I can't see them off the street, why should I go get shelter for myself? Because right now, I have to prove a point as a Stonewall veteran. I find myself back in this situation, but as I look at the river a lot of times, and Marsha gives me a lot of strength, is that I gotta keep fighting for somebody. Marsha was a fighter. We were both fighters. I actually feel her spirit telling me, you got to keep fighting, girlie, because it's not time for you to cross the River Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> After the interview on the PR 96, we became very good friends, because then she came here and started working, stringing Christmas ornaments. It was just incredible. You know, I, I said to myself, I said, she wants to work at the store. This queen is going to last three hours a day, you know, two days at the most, please, no, you know, but, oh, I'll give her a shot. You know what I mean? Like, it was just enough where I said, oh, I'll give her, you know, I'll give anybody a try. You know what I mean? And then in my amazement, she turned out to be incredible. They tell me, my computer man and other, just told me a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know this at the time, but when I would really be getting on Sylvia's nerves, she'd become humming this tune. Yes, we have no bananas. We have no bananas today. In 95, about, I was at a thing Clags was doing um, up on 42nd Street at the university there. And uh, they had a, uh, the last panel was this thing on Stonewall. And uh, Silvio was there. And I was like, hi, remember me? I'm one of your kids, you know, that sort of thing. And where you been? I guess I was intrigued by her, you know, when I first saw her. She was, she was had a lot of energy, you know. She was talking about how she'd been homeless and she'd been living on a pier and that sort of thing. And I said, uh, hey, you're not homeless. I got a, a place. As long as I got a place, you're not homeless. Yeah, that sort of thing, you know. So she, uh, she didn't move in right away, but she started coming around, you know. Julia had been close with me and Rusty, and uh, she was living here with us at the time. I just started spending a lot of time with her. She asked if she could stay here. The idea was she was going to live here. She'd do some work in the backyard, do some work around the house in uh, lieu of paying rent. Maybe this would be more important to me than it would be to her because, uh, after, you know, when we first moved in together, she was like, she made us, she was like decorating, you know, and, uh, you know, that was when, when Pokemon was first starting, so she, like Pikachu and so I bought one of these for mm -hmm. The first couple of years were hardest because when she first moved in, I mean, I loved Sylvia to death, but she was a uh, hardcore alcoholic. I mean, she was an unqualified drunk. When she, mo when she moved here, she would drink every day. I mean, she would come home from work, sit down in a chair, uh, open her second or third uh, quart of vodka for the day, and... Uh, that was about it. She spent all her time in the living room downstairs. And uh, she slept down there and watched TV down there. And uh, I just remember, you know, I wanted to do things for her, you know. And she, um, she used to go like this to me when I would come in, you know. And I'd go back like that to her. And she, um, she used to call me an angel, you know, because I guess of the fact I was helping her, you know. And Julia would come in to help Sylvia. So, I mean, I saw this relationship literally take root and grow. And uh, Julia and Sylvia became an item. Chelsea, you know, asked 
asked me whether we were lovers, and so I asked her. And she, you know, I mean, they almost became inseparable, and then that got where you never saw one without the other. I was at work, and she said, uh, you know, she came up to me and said, well, I've been thinking about it all day, you know, and she said, I've decided we are lovers. But what was so incredible is that Julia did something for Sylvia that no one else in the world ever did. After a while, uh, Julia, uh, Sylvia quit drinking. Uh, apparently, you know, the relationship with Julia gave her some impetus uh, for doing that. Julia kept Sylvia sober. No, no one has ever been th as enthusiastic about me as she was. I mean, she was like, she would, um, you know, she would caress me like I was a gift. Julia gave Sylvia that extra leg she needed. And then she got, like, incredibly politically active again and uh, started doing some really wonderful work. And, you know, she was more her. She really was ferocious when she got sober. Straight on, you know. <coughs> right. <laughs> Powerful, you know. She was totally responsible. I mean, first time in her life, I was just so proud of her. And I used to tell her constantly, and it used to make her so happy. And she used to say, oh, I'm so happy when you tell me you're proud of me. She rose above circumstances. I mean, she getting me in a child process at the age of 10, you know, and, and a drug addict, and all these awful experiences that went on in her life. And you would have thought that she would have just, as she got older, would have gotten uglier and more mm -hmm. twisted. And instead, somehow, she went through this, this roller coaster ride of tragedy and suddenly bloom like a, a, a new rose of spring or something. Mm -hmm. I should say an opium poppy. <laughs> I mean, other people can talk about this better than I can. I mean, she got religion at the end of her life. She was very actively involved in the MCC. Um, she came to the church about four years ago and began attending on Sunday on a regular base, basis. She began volunteering in the food pantry, which uh, serves um, people who are living in poverty in the city and also people living with AIDS. And uh, eventually, the director of our food pantry resigned, and we hired Sylvia as the director of the food pantry. I call these, but I have them lined up like this. My soldiers to fight hunger. That's my little nickname. Sylvia had a very deep, uh, deep passion for uh, people living in poverty in this city. Not just the trans community, not just the queer community, but anybody uh, who didn't have the kind of housing or the kind of clothing or the kind of medical care or the kind of resources that it really takes to survive, much less live, in New York City. I can go home and say that I've actually tried to make a difference and not sit down and talk about it or plan to do something about it. She just had this way about her that people from all walks of life would end up here getting groceries or lunches or some kind of food or clothing or housing assistance from us. And she really um, helped us, I think, develop that ministry and take it the next step. It makes me feel good that we're able to reach a few people. But um, in the long run, it's still not enough. But every little bit helps. The other thing that will always stick with me is while, when we were really wrestling with Sonda, uh, she came to me one day and asked me if I understood uh, what I was doing in terms of calling for an inclusive Sonda, if I knew what that meant. And I said that I did. It meant that I wouldn't leave her behind. She didn't let people go blindly into the positions that they took. She, she wanted to make sure that you understood what you were saying, what you might be giving up, what you might be sacrificing in order to stand with her. And I really admire that kind of, um, not only forthrightness, but that kind of honesty and integrity. The transgender movement 
is very marginalized. And she had a vision, and she continued to fight for that vision. Even Matt Foreman and Joe Graywars had come to have a meeting with her in the hospital and uh, about the Sonda bill, and Sylvia was being so anxious to get that passed before she died. I mean, on your own deathbed, to summons ESPA, the people from the Empire State Agenda Committee, to your deathbed to plead the case, and <clears throat> don't leave my people behind. Brilliant strategy. I didn't sit in on the meeting. I went out to get something to eat. But Reverend Pat sat in on the meeting. There were four of us, actually, in her room. Matt and Joe agreed to come to her hospital bedside and meet with her about Sonda. And when I came back up, Sylvia was extremely happy whatever they had said uh, satisfied Sylvia. She was able to actually negotiate um, in an amazingly competent uh, way as she lay there in her hospital bed um, and got uh, ESPA to agree to having a trans person on their board of directors and was able to present her list of demands to them.